Well, I've been holding out for a while because I guess I wanted to prove that Charlie Marlowe and myself could could do this on our own. And um, I've always wanted to interview my big brother, Rusty Wallace, and here he is. Brother, thank you for being on Kenny Conversation. You're welcome, buddy. No problem. Yeah, it's, it's a pretty big day for me, and I, I appreciate you taking time to do that. So, Kenny Conversation is just that, brother. We, we call audibles. We go any which way. And uh, so starting out, where, where are you at right now? Well, right now I'm down here in uh, Florida. I'm uh, down here in the Daytona Beach area. I came here for the race last week and broadcasted a race on Saturday night. And so Patty and I decided to stay down here for a some, some little, little longer time. And so I'm here right now just enjoying it. Yeah, and, and I've been there. Now, there, there's a lot of things I already know, but a lot of people don't know. And one of the number one questions I get asked, anywhere I go in America, what's your big brother Rusty Wallace doing? But before we start, you taught me something years ago that I'll never forget. And, and I use it to this day, and people always have fun with it. You taught me, it, it's sad to say, but we have to remind people. So I'm going to remind everybody before we before we start. Rusty Wallace, uh, 1984 NASCAR Cup Rookie of the Year, NASCAR Hall of Famer, International Motorsports Hall of Famer, Motorsports Hall of Famer, National Motorsports Press Hall of Famer. Brother, you're in every damn hall. You a Hall of Famer. That's all there is to that. And that yeah. Was- that's kind of, that's, I'm appreciative to that. I'm in seven Hall of Fames, and so that that's a good feeling. Yeah, they, and I know I haven't named them all off. I, up here in Missouri, you're in a lot of Hall of Fames here, but just a little bit more. Uh, 1983 ASA champion, 1989 Cup champion. That's the big one. 1989 Cup champion. You and Earnhardt went at it. Uh, 1991 IROC champion. 55 cup wins. You, you've truly done it all. Uh, what, if, what do you think about that? I mean, I know life can be a blur. Well, what do you think about that when I say that? I just, uh, it makes me feel incredibly humble. I, you know, as you're a young racer coming up like I was, uh, it took a lot of people to help me get here. That's for sure. And I can name off everybody and you know them all. But, I mean, it, I was so focused when I was driving. It was incredible. And so you had to be to accomplish all those goals I was able to accomplish. And so what do I think about it? I think about it. It brings back all kinds of memories about all the different tracks I've been on and the different paths I've took in my life and the different opportunities that came up, and uh, which put me where I am right now. So if I wouldn't have done those things, I wouldn't be able to achieve the goals I got right now. And the things that I uh, have right now. So I hope I answered that question. I don't know if I did in full, but I, you know, I'll, I'll never forget when I got put in the Hall of Fame, the NASCAR Hall of Fame, and I got all said and done. And uh, I was leaving the place, and they were having us go out the back door. And Ned Jarrett, uh, Dale Jarrett's father, got a hold of him because he got put in, I think, the year before. He said, man, your life's going to change. I said, why is that? He said, you've been, you've been a competitor your whole life, and everybody wants to teach you, and they want to do this, and they want to do that. And there's, there's some fans that like you, some that don't like you. But when you get put in the Hall of Fame, it's a whole different deal. They're going to start calling you sir instead of rusty or, <laughs> or jerk or punk or whatever, you know. Yeah. They're going to respect you more. And so, you know, that's what the people have done to me. I mean, once I got put in that Hall of Fame, my life slowed down a little bit more. Uh Got some really nice respect out of people. And I think when you talk to the rest of the Hall of Famers, they'll tell you exactly what I just told you. It's a whole life-changing experience, a different feeling that's sometimes hard to explain. Yeah, I'm going to interview you, but there's no doubt that I know you as good as anybody. Uh, You've been married to Patty. You've been with Patty, your wife, your whole life. She's the love of my life, too. And, you know, Stephen and Katie and Greg. uh, So... When I grew up with you, uh, I felt that you were ex- more focused than anybody I've ever been around. You know, I'm 60 now, you're 67. When I look back, 
there, there were times we would leave the race shop at midnight and we'd be driving home and, and I'd start talking to you and uh, I, you didn't hear me. And I said, Rusty, and it's just me and you. I've always felt that you have preached focus to me. And I, I think you're laser focused and, and you, you've been upset with me or other drivers for not really getting into their chassis. And, and I feel like one of the reasons you're so good is you're laser focused and you're into your race cars. Well, you're, you, if that's what you think, you're right. Because <laughs> I had to be so focused as on real. Now, remember, in my, the height of my career, I mean, there was no instrumentation. There was no simulation. There was none of that stuff that's out there today. Not, not to say that a driver's any least or any worse off or better off. Uh, when it comes to all that technology. But back then, I mean, I, I grew up in the short tracks where, hey, you had to learn how to weld. You had to build your own engines. You had to paint your car. You had to be able to load the thing up, haul it across the country. You had to race. And every time the car wasn't handling right, you're the guy that you had to be able to give that information to your crew guys to, hey, man, this thing's not handling correctly. Here's what I do. I've always was the type of driver that, man, going through those extra steps was really tough for me to have to explain everything to somebody. When I felt like I knew what was wrong, I'd say, just do that. Change the spring, change that shock, do whatever. I called it, you really had to be under the hood and right down in the carburetor, man. You had to know what was going on with that car. If you're going to be able to control your own destiny. You know, if you want to be a consistent winner and run up front all the time, you better know what the hell's going on under the hood of that car. And what makes it perform? Because let's face it, if you got a car that's going to handle real well and run real well and be up front leading races, that's the type of stuff that's going to make you famous. That's what's going to get you where you want to be. You got to know it. I was never the guy that had to put my whole entire career on somebody else's hands mm. when it comes to that type of stuff. Now, let's talk about the business stuff that comes with that. So once you're a racer, you're successful when you're doing all that. Then you better start surrounding yourself with some pretty, pretty smart people if you think you're going to get better and better. But, you know, I was always focused. I had so many people come up to me and say, hey, man, why aren't you smiling? I said, I thought I was smiling. I said, no, you're not smiling. I said, OK. I said, it's because I'm just focused right now. My mind is on something. And then they would keep on me, you know. And I said, you know what? I got this unique ability of, and I said, what's that? I got this unique ability to filter out bullshit. And that's what I'm getting out of you right now. You're the best. <laughs> so I would tell him crap like that. You know, I said, don't tell me what I'm doing wrong or not. I just, but this is the way I roll, man. I gotta, I gotta be focused and I gotta do it the way I'm doing it to understand it. And uh, I think I, you know, you have, we all have mentors that help you understand and think different ways. Don Miller was one of the guys that helped me get started when I was back in Missouri. My business stuff, Dick Pacer was always there to help me guide me all through that type of stuff. You know, Obviously, Roger Penske taught me so much about, uh, you know, life on and off the racetrack. Where do you get to those people in detail? Stuff like that, you know. So it really, there, you had to have a lot of people. There was a quote by Felix Sabatis. Uh, he said something about you, and it, and it made me look. Because I, there was a little truth to it. Uh, and, you know, mind you, there's been a lot said about you. But I, I thought this one was funny but I want to have, I want your take on it. He said, uh, when you were, you know, in the cup series, he said a monkey could be Rusty Wallace's crew chief and Rusty would still win because everybody knew how good you were at making your race car go fast. What, what are what is your thoughts? I mean, did, did you need a great crew chief or what, did, what do you think of Felix saying that? Well, that's, that's humbling and awful nice to come out of Felix because he's a great buddy of mine, and I just love him to death. I, he's always treated me really well. But I think what he's probably referring to is how into the car I was, and everybody always thought I just commanded the chassis of the car, which I kind of did. But, man, there's no way to get it done unless you have really good people. I mean, so I can't – no, I can't do that all by myself. There's no I in a team. I tell people that all the time. Uh, I maybe I was more aggressive and more involved than most drivers he's ever had are RC. I mean, I had great guys like Robin Pemberton. I had Buddy Parrott. I had Todd Parrott. 
you know, I had uh, Barry Dotson. I had all those guys that were A plus guys that helped me get to where I was. And I, there's no way in the world I could say, oh, it was me. Uh, and I know what Felix is saying there because it feels like I'm dominating all the conversations and I want this and I want that. I think that's the reason he said all that. Yeah, I, um, I ask all these questions because, you know, as I race around all these dirt tracks throughout America, I have these mom and dads come up to me all the time, Rusty, and, the, and they'll say, man, my, my kid's won 14 championships. He's 10 years old. How do I make it to NASCAR? And it, it's hard to tell people, you know, what they need to do because when, when I rode with you and I rode on your coattails and I was with you in that truck and trailer, we just did what you told us to do. And, and man, we were in victory lane all the damn time. Uh, now, as we move forward and, and you, you did, you did get aggravated for a while because there were drivers coming into the sport like Jeff Gordon or Ricky Rudd. They really didn't even know their race car. Uh, what do you think about that when drivers don't know their car and they run good? Oh man, it, I, I don't want everybody to be like me. This was the only <laughs> way. This was the only way I knew how to do it. So yeah. I just had to do it my own way, you know. And, yeah. And I've had conversations with Gordon a couple times when we got heated, or we were at the track, and uh, a couple times after I quit driving the car in '05, uh, I was broadcasting for ESPN, and I was with. Uh, watching him struggle at Michigan. And I went down there and he was testy because he was frustrated and this and that. And I said, you need to pay some more attention to that car. And he spun around. He said, well, if you had let the crew do it on your half, you'd have probably won more races. You focus too much. I'm like, oh, okay. Now we're really going to debate that. And I just went down to tell him that, you know, he was kind of acting like he was giving up on himself because he was kind of lost at that day in Michigan. And I wanted him to pay more attention, you know, Instead, he flipped it on me, hmm. which is okay. But um, I tell you that, hey, there's great race drivers out there. I mean, you had uh, did that guy right there. You're talking about uh, Jeff Gordon. I mean, Tony Stewart. Uh, there's a guy that is involved in this car more than people think, you know. Who else can I throw in there? You know, you mentioned Ricky Rudd. Ricky Rudd was a um, hell of a driver. He can really manhandle and carry a car. I mean, a great road racer. Great short track racer. Maybe you didn't see him working on a car, but there's one thing I respected about those type of guys. They could flat drive, you know? Yeah. Um, I got problems that with people that don't understand the car and aren't too good at drivers, but they're in a top position. Yeah. I said, there's so much more room for more talented people than that, that the way that's happening. So I, I don't, I don't want to go no farther than that, except that, you know, I, I just, if you're going to be, Man, if you're going to be a professional driver, be all in, you know. Just be all in. That's all I'm asking. Right. So I, I think I've laid the groundwork. Uh, the reason Rusty Wallace was so good from my viewpoint, and I wanted to hear yours, is that you knew how to make your race car go good. When, when people talk to me about you, I say, Rusty is a gadgeteer. He'll, he'll figure things out. If we had things broke around the house, Rusty was the one that was going to fix it. So – Let's move forward now, but in that same conversation. So here we are now, year 2023. I had to take a look. <laughs> yep, we're, we're in 2023, brother. And, and now we're plugging computers into the motors to tune them. Now we have cars that, you know, simulate some type of an Indy car look, the turtle shell bottom. Uh, a lot of carbon fiber. And now the driver, you know, the, the, the car is so numb, they don't feel the car do anything except pushing or loose. What is your what is your thought about these drivers now? And as, as you do MRN radio and you listen, what about these drivers now? It's hard for them to be somebody like you were. Well, it's, it's kind of like these drivers that we really maybe didn't know real well. Let them really show their talent. Uh, when you make a car basically identical from car to car, uh, I mean, NASCAR's got stringent rules and, and, and the, the templates and all the stuff they use are right down to the thousandths of an inch. Uh, they have to be the same. They, you, know, they, you can't buy these parts from all type of different people. I mean, if, 
If you're going to buy a part for an NASCAR car, it's got to come from that particular vendor. If you're going to buy a, a wheel part, it's got to come from one vendor. So basically, when it's all said and done, these cars are identical. So what that's enabled people to do, it's enabled drivers that we might not see as front runners because they never were involved in the best cars in the back because the cars were so much different. And I had no problem with the cars being different because they let everybody be inventive. I mean, they operated under the same rules. They did their deal maybe better than other people. But when you take all that out and now you go, okay, here's the car. Maybe you can do it better than other people, but you can't because here's the rules and this is the cars and now the cars are all the same. Let's see what these drivers can do. And so you see a guy like Ross Chastain, which I always knew was a pretty good driver, but I never thought he was a great driver up front all the time. And now we see him up front all the time, you know, uh, William Byron. There's a guy that I've always uh, looked at as a young man that, uh, you know, real studious fella that was real quiet and I never heard of him. And all of a sudden here he is winning five races this year. You know, you see these drivers that you never focused on. You knew they were out driving, but I was looking at Kevin Harvick's and I was looking at guys like that, you know, Kyle Busch's, uh, the, the normal guys week in and week out. And uh, so now I look at those guys, but these other guys are there all the time too now. And this car is really the superstars out of some drivers that I never, ever put a lot of focus in. And maybe it's really got these, these guys, these, uh, these drivers that I'm seeing now that I didn't pay attention to, it's, it's, it's turning them into superstars. It's giving those guys a lot of confidence in yourself that they're just as good as anybody else out there. But I would have never known that unless this car would have come out where it was identical, so where they could all get in and show their talent. So I want to I want to get to a lot more MRN. I want to get to your opinion on Ryan Priest and how you compare all your flips. But but as you're talking, I'm listening really well. Uh, when I think of racing in the past, I think of your car owner, the great Roger Penske, uh, Richard Childers, Jack Roush. All these great car owners that knew that if they built the best team and the, the best cars that, you know, they were going to win. Now, you know, listening to what you say, and I agree with you, by the way, now you got car owners coming in, they buy the car like a kit car, and then they hire some people to put it all together and they're competitive. Is that good or bad for the sport? Well, I, I hear exactly where you're coming from on that one. Uh, the, the good thing about the sport is that it's, it's, it's got new, new, new people coming in that we've never seen before. It, we're creating new superstars, okay? And yeah. whether I like it or not, the, the race fans like that. They want to see new superstars. I mean, that, that fellow from Australia – who won the Chicago street race. Yeah. Where did that come from? Right. Yeah. <laughs> where, where this guy? I've never heard of this guy in my entire life, but then you research that guy and he's a, he's a three or four time world champion in, in supercars over in that area. You know? It's a big world. So, so it makes sense that he, he ran as good as he did, but I never heard of him and didn't know nothing. He just jumped in a car that he's never seen in life, you know, and just wheeled it around and won. Uh, but then when you got, you know, uh, Penske and Roush and Childress and Olympics spending and all the money, all the money on development to, you know, build a better car and have faster pit stops and all that to all be neutralized and say, okay, I got all new rules now. Now you can't do none of that stuff any longer that you spent your life doing. Yeah. That's frustrating. But um, you got to understand that you're still messing with them springs. You're still messing with them shocks. And you're still got to have a fast pit crew. You still can't screw up on that pit stop. And as a driver, you come, can't come down pit road too fast. And, you know, still every single week when I'm broadcasting these races, they're still messing that up. They're still speeding on pit road. They're still messing up the pit stop, you know. Maybe the guy should have shot it up high on the top side on a restart. And he decided to go down in the middle and crashed, you know. So things are there's so many moving parts that you can still have an influence on, even though the car's been dumbed down and they're real simple and they're exactly the same for everybody. Um, it's, it's still that, you know, you can still have a human hand that messes everything up and there's still a lot of things you can do to uh, be a great car owner and uh, feel like you're, you got the best team because of how hard you're working. Cause there's still a lot of room out there to play with the car.
and yeah. ways to manipulate the race, the outcome of the race. So you, you mentioned, uh, and this is what I wanted to get to, you're, you're working with MRN Radio every once in a while when you want to. You're your own man now. You, you've got a lot going on, and we'll get to that. Tell me about working with MRN. Uh, why do you like doing that? And I do want to talk about that Saturday night race at Daytona. Okay. Well, I, uh, I, love MR, I love MRN. The, the number one thing I liked about MRN is when I went over there that those guys, and when I first started, <clears throat> first started working over there, it's been uh, nine years ago now. I've been with broadcast. The next year will be 10 years with MRN. And, you know, those guys, they know exactly what they're talking about. You know, you had, uh, you had uh, Jeff Striegel now in the booth, and you have Alex Hayden in the booth. Those guys worked on pit road. They worked up. You had a guy named Joe Moore that was there all the time. Uh, Dave Moody's there all the time. Mike Bagley's there all the time. They're racers. Those are racers, and those guys know everything about the car. They know everything about the sport. They really get it. They know it. And so I knew when I went to work with them, I wasn't going in with just a couple guys. I knew I was going with a whole team that had their crap together. They knew what was going on. Yeah. And the schedule fit my schedule. So uh, when the ESPN contract was over and that was all finished and NBC had all their guys, Fox had all their guys. And I said, well, look, I still want to be in the sport. And I got a phone call from NASCAR and said, hey, we'd like to have you over here at MRN. I said, okay. I went down to Daytona and talked to them. And this still changed a little bit. I mean, the, I wanted to be with them. They wanted to be with me. I wanted to do maybe a pre-race show and originally. And we had some different ideas. But basically what happened, I went down and said, let's we want to put you in a booth for the Daytona 500. So I got a booth for the 500. It went really, really well. We had a great time, had a great race. And that day they said, I don't want him to do nothing else except being in that booth. And so that's what I did. And that's what I really, really enjoyed. So then my schedule was 21 MRN races. And that's what I was doing. And then when mm -hmm. COVID hit, we had it streamlined everything. We had half the amount of people going to the races we were doing things, uh, using half the resources to get the job done. It's like NASCAR running the race, and they didn't qualify. They didn't practice. They didn't do nothing. They did it as lean as they possibly can, just put them on a racetrack and go. That's kind of how they did with MRN. And so we got real lean on that. And so my schedule went from uh, 21 races down to 14. And I said, no, wait a minute. You know, I don't like this 14. It's, it's let me really be involved in the sport, be a, still – be you know passionate about it and then uh, so I said I'm okay with the 14 and so when it came down to retalk I said let's just stay at 14 they said okay yeah. <laughs> so this year this year it came went down to 11 I think it was and uh it, we're still accomplishing what we want to accomplish and I'm getting to do all the big races you know I'll do the championship race in Phoenix Arizona I just got done doing the uh, the pre the the, the final uh, regular season race in Daytona which is a big one I do Martinsville, which is a big, big race that leads into who's going to make the final four going into Phoenix. I do the Daytona 500. I, do, I still get to all the big races that are uh, really uh, big ones, and, uh, and it's fun, and we all get along fantastic. We just had a great broadcast on Saturday night here in Daytona, and we all high-fived each other and smiled and laughed, and I just really feel good about these guys. I, I love working with them, and uh, like I say, it's been 10 years. And uh, we'll see what happens again next year. You know, if, if uh, when I do it next year, that'll be 10 years. Do I want to do more than 10? I don't know, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You, you, you seem like you're always moving and going. Uh, people say, what's your brother doing? I say, I don't know. He, sometimes he's in another country on a riverboat cruise or you've got so many things going on. So let's, I want to stay on this course. So you, you did the race Saturday night at Daytona and your name was almost trending in social media because as you were calling the race, you watched Ryan Priest flip end over end down the back straightaway. Horrible. One of the worst, it, that thing was like, like a dog grabbing a cat. I mean, uh, he flipped probably 10, 11 times. Now, let me just say this. In 1982 at Daytona, in the number 72 Ramada in car, you flipped horrible. Uh, from what I remember, it was the Kodak car, Rick Wilson. I thought he got into you. Richard Petty was into that. That was a twin 125. Now, we move forward 
I think, to 1993. You're in the Miller Genuine draft card, and you flip violently. Uh, then you go to Talladega, and Ern Earnhardt tagged you in the left rear, I believe, coming across the finish line, and you flip violently again. So in your super speedway career, I think you've wrecked as much as anybody, going for the win, battling. So when you saw Ryan Priest go through that, the, you know, the fans started thinking, man, that reminded me of Rusty. Give me your thoughts on just everything I talked about. Well, you know, everybody has bad wrecks in their career. You know, it's, it's going to happen to everybody. You know, it's happened to me. Unfortunately, it happened to Earnhardt really bad. I've seen Tony Stewart go through it. I've seen Ricky Rudd go through it. I've seen a lot of drivers go through it. And that was what, so that was to go to that particular wreck, Ryan Priest, what went through my mind? Immediately went, went through my mind after it was all done. I said, it was a really violent wreck. I mean, he wasn't just there. I've seen many guys just go and spin and flip and go over and, and they're doing soft landings, call it, you know, as the car's flipping, they're just touching the front fender, touching the rear quarter panel, stuff like that. But every impact that car made was violent. I mean, it would crash on the rear quarter panels. It would crash on the nose. It would crash on the roof and it would hit hard every single time. Uh, so I'm like, wow, the violent, how violent it was is unreal. It's a real test of that car to see how tough that car really is. And I'm sure NASCAR's got that car right now. They're probably all over that. Their research center there in Concord, North Carolina. Other thing that went through my mind was, okay, that car got dead sideways and was dead in the position my car was when I went airborne and flipped. But we came up with the roof lap, which was supposed to keep that car on the ground. Well, I always call, there, there's certain things you just can't control. And one of them is momentum. The other is force. And the other one is term I use when you get in a big record. Daytona Talladega called, you're just getting pole vaulted. Hmm. And basically what happened to him, he left a smooth surface of asphalt, entered the grass. And as he entered the grass, it gave more air between the bottom of the car, underneath the car. And I, we watched watch that thing over and over and over, and that air got underneath that car. And the force was so great, and the motion was so great, that it, it, it wouldn't let the, the roof flap really do its job. It wouldn't let it keep it down on a flat surface and just spin around the circle, and that'd be it. It almost got pole vaulted over. It, it got forced over. It got pushed over, whatever you want to call it. But wanted to hit that grass, uh, the surface that, that, it, that it was on sliding on completely changed. And it put it in the sky. I went, wow, that's the first time I've seen all these things happen where it just basically took the dog on roof flap and said, hey, the baby with that roof flap was popped straight up and down. It was trying to do all it could, but it still went upside down. And when, once you get that thing upside down, then, then it's just going to take over. Mother Nature's going to do its deal. So your experience with, you know, the violent flips you've had, Ryan Priest uh, says he's okay. I remember after Talladega, you broke your wrist, I think, and we had the, the legendary black brace. You went to Sears Point. You still shifted the hell out of that race car. What is Ryan? Uh, I mean, you have experience at, at violent flips. Is he going to be fine? I mean, he's a good racer, but is he going to be okay? Well, he's the only one that's going to know if he's going to be okay. I mean, if the doctors say he's okay and he says he's okay, I trust that he's okay. Uh, but I'll never forget. I mean, you got these little goofy things that happen to your body that doesn't affect anything you do, but I'm going to give you an explanation. Okay. Back driving the number 72 car. Yeah. You know, that was the car that uh, I had the horrible wreck in and uh, I'll never forget that wreck because it was muddy that night before the race. And I went down to, you remember going off to see I, I was the first one to see you in the infield care center. I went, I was wearing a solid red uniform and uh, I went down through that mud. And there was so much mud in that back straight. I'm not cars flipping through it in a completely loaded hole inside of the car up with mud, destroyed it. They pulled me out, put me on a, on a, uh, on a stretcher. I'll never forget going into the infield care center. And there you were, you were crying. You were freaking yeah, out. I was... thought you lost your brother. You know why? Because all that red was sticking through the mud. And what that was is there, I was so caked with mud that all you could see is these little red spots and you thought I was bleeding to death. Yeah. Remember that? Oh, it was it devastating. Was a devastating. 
that was unbelievable. Yeah, yeah, and, and you had an open face helmet on, so the the sand is coming through. As you told me later on, when we were able to relax about it, you said that sand they were digging it out of your nose, out of your everywhere, you know, uh, because oh, it, it was high it speed was sand. Crazy. <laughs> it was crazy, but after the wreck, I had that big bad wreck, and I noticed that every time I went and got in the shower, I used to get the shower shower down and I'd shake my head like an old dog, you know, to get all the yeah. water off my head. Ear out of, water out of ears. And yeah, and every time I shook my head to this day, every time I shake my head, I got to hold on to something because I'll get dizzy. Yeah. And it happened uh, when I wrecked that car. Yeah. It, it'll, it'll just move some things around in your brain that cause you to get, get vertigo every now and then. Now, I drive a car, I do anything I want, I don't feel nothing. It's just when I take and shake my head in the damn shower, I'm like, okay. So now yeah. back to Ryan Priest. He's the only one that knows. And I'll guarantee you, every driver dog went through something, you know, uh, he'll know, hey, am I, am I okay or am I not okay? And I, I'm telling you the story, so I don't have a problem telling you the story. I hope that there's something wrong with him. He don't have a problem telling me that. Now, I'm sure I'm sure he'll be fine driving a car and stuff like that, but uh, – and then there's some people who aren't so fortunate, like uh, Kurt Busch. Yeah. He tried and tried and tried and tried to get his head back right, but he just said, "I'm just not like I'm just not right. I'm just not back right, and I just can't drive these cars to the potential they can be driven because I'm just not right yet." Now, if you talk to him, if you stand right here, perfect conversation. You can do anything you want, but he knows when he gets in that car under those forces and all that stuff, he's not where he needs to be. So. Will yeah. Ryan Priest be okay? I don't know. I don't yeah, know. The other one that scared me about Ryan Blaney, that head on collision. Yes. Uh, the wall, cool. one, that scared me to death because I saw his head fly completely forward. I saw the tethers, whole tumbling back, and he was still only that far from the steering wheel. That one there scared me too. That's another one where when he wakes up, I hope he feels good under all these different circumstances too. Yeah. I, I know, you know, all these years later, I can definitely say that when uh, I got knocked out in 1991 at New Hampshire, um, it changed. I'm still Kenny, but it 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 knocked the hell out of me. Uh, that's why I asked that question. Yeah. I knew I had experience like that. Okay, so here we are, already 35 minutes, and we try to make Kenny conversation tolerable. You know, an hour. Um, let's let's move on. You know, and, and this could be a five hour conversation, but I want to talk about where you're at in your life right now uh you know you you have nine dealerships nine auto dealerships in knoxville tennessee uh and then we also have the nascar foundation you have southern country customs uh now the nascar foundation you raise a lot of money for them uh southern country customs you and steven uh your boy my nephew, who I love very much. Uh, you guys are building badass motorcycles. But let, let's start with the dealerships first. Um, how did that start? What's your involvement with nine dealerships in Knoxville, Tennessee? Well, it all, it all started back in the 80s when I was, uh, you know, driving for Pontiac. Yeah. Uh, driving the, I believe it was driving the, the Blue Max car back then. And I was able to go to Bristol and be pretty successful and, and won nine races when it was all said and done. Yeah, you were bad was, was a Pontiac dealer in Morristown, Tennessee. And it was uh, called Parker Pontiac. And it was owned by a man named Ray Huffaker, which is still my partner to today. And he asked me to come for an autograph session. Well, I showed up for an autograph session. And we had just hundreds and hundreds of people show up. It was a big gathering. Thousands. It could have been. A lot of people. That week I left and I went back to Bristol. I think this autograph session, I believe, was on a Thursday night. And so then I went to Bristol that weekend, which was only like 60 miles down the road, and I won again. And he goes, holy smokes, would you come back? So I went back and we had more people than I had the first time. Yeah. Then he said, hey, next time, would you bring Dale Earnhardt with you? Oh, and wow. So, so we went back for another autograph session. And Earnhardt had a Chevrolet dealership. He said, if you come to a Chevrolet store, I'll come to your Pontiac store. I said, okay. So he showed up. We had a ton of people again. So then he got a hold of me and said, hey, have you ever thought about being in a car business? And uh, I said, I, yes, I have. I'm a car guy, but I don't know anything about it. Even That doesn't make me smart in the car business, but I'm a car guy. And yeah, I'd be super interested in it. 
So he gave me all the information. And I, I'll never forget. I, I took it to Roger Penske and I let Roger run through it and look at it. Now we're fast forward a little bit right now. We're in 1991 now because uh, I just mentioned, I think three years doing autograph sessions for Ray Huffaker at the, the store. So uh, I show this to Roger and he said, you know what, son? He said, you're not going to be able to drive these cars forever. And you better get your life together because you got to do something after this all stops. And so that's when I really started focusing on the dealerships. And he kind of tutored me around a little bit, getting going on that, uh, with just with some ideas. Uh, but then when I hooked up with Ray Huffaker, that was the biggest move. That was one of the most positive things in my entire life. Uh, Ray and I started... Uh, Rusty Wallace Pontiac, GMC, Cadillac in Morristown, Tennessee. Then we were able to buy a, um, a Honda dealership in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Then we were able to buy a Toyota dealership in Morristown, Tennessee. And it went on and on and on. And uh, so, you know, after racing, uh, Ray's probably responsible for a lot of the, the big things that's happened in my life financially. Uh, because those dealerships have really been real good. We have a ton of money to charity. We care a ton about our community. We care a lot about service after the sale. Uh, that's one thing Penske always did tell me. So look, you can buy a car anywhere, but you're never going to get service after the sale like you do at our dealerships. Yeah. So, you know, I beat that in our guys' heads. I have to do that. They know that. Uh, all our guys up there, real personable. We got funny guys. You know Chad Campbell real I've well. I've been there. Yeah, I was He's at your hunt. I saw there. them all. You got a guy named Cougar. Uh, Cougar is just another one. Over they're there. country boys, but boy, they can talk like me and you. <laughs> they're, they're honest guys. They care a ton about the community, you know. Uh, they really are. And so life's good in the car business stuff right now. I've been in it for 33 years now. 33 years in the car business. People don't even know. So a lot of people don't even know I'm, I'm doing that. But, you know, so uh, that, that that's my main deal right now, the dealerships. Let me just stop you there for a minute. I, I, you know, like I said, I'm listening. You and Earnhardt, you talked about, you know, bring Earnhardt to your dealership. Back in those days, you and Earnhardt were able to battle and, and get into each other and stay friends. Uh, you, you two had it going on. You, you two, Rusty Wallace and Dale Earnhardt Sr., you guys were the show. Uh, how were you able to stay friends through all that? Uh, we did a lot of things outside of racing. I mean, we, we would go to a lot of boat trips together. We ended up going down to the Bahamas quite a bit. Uh, my wife and uh, Dave's wife, Teresa, were really, really great friends and still are, although we haven't seen her in a long, long time. But, uh, but I remember I'd go over his farm, took some of the kids over there, and he would teach my kids how to shoot a gun. You know, he'd put them on a sandbag and we do all this different stuff in, his, in, in this big farm he had. And, and we did a lot of stuff outside of racing. And that's one of the things that was so upsetting when I'd go, we'd have a lot of fun, maybe the Bahamas, or maybe we'd go here and have a good time or do the gun thing. Uh, but then you get to the racetrack and he'd be so focused on what he was doing and I'd be so focused on what I'm doing. I was always expecting him to want to hang out more at the track, but he once told me, he said, man, he said, if I, if I'm not focused, you're going to beat me. And I'm like, if I don't focus, you're going to beat me. And so we focused like crazy and he had his own set of fans and I had my own set of fans and we did our own deal. And when that was over, uh, it might be a couple of weeks since I'd see him and we'd do something. We'd go have some fun somewhere. We always had a good time, but I tell those boat stories every now and then, because that's one thing he was super passionate about. You know, had his fishing boat. He had his big yacht that he had built. He did all the kind of a lot of stuff. And we all loved going on to Bill's Bahamas all the time. And the guy who started all that was Bill French Jr. Uh, yeah. Back in the day, he, he used to take some drivers down to the Bahamas and talk rules and try to understand the sport more. He would take more motors guys, Ford guys, different guys down there. And, and um, you know, the, the tire manufacturers and talk to them and get ideas. And, and I was fortunate enough to invite him to every single one of those trips. Uh, I think that went on for 18 straight years before it finally ended. After Mr. France passed away, that's when it ended. And so, uh, but yeah, I, I, I knew Erna really, really got off the track because of that type of stuff. You know? You, you know, it was once said, and I believe it's me that said it, and there had been some other people that Dale Earnhardt Sr. and Rusty Wallace 
are the two strongest mentally prepared race car drivers in NASCAR, you know, uh, at, at that time. What, you know, and as I listen to you right now, you talk about Earnhardt when he went to the racetrack, he had to focus to beat you. I feel like you and him, it, it, was, it was also more talent than driving. Yes, you had talent driving, but I felt like you and him were equally hard headed. Like, like you're not going to get me. I'm going to win at everything. Nobody gets me. W- would you say that's right? Well, I, I always felt that when I went to the track in that era now, in that era, the drivers I was racing on a weekly basis that I had to beat, uh, he was the main one, okay? Mark Martin was really, really good. Yeah. Ricky Rudd, really, really good. Guys like that, okay? But he he was the one that I felt like if I beat him, I really, really accomplished something. Yeah. And they said, what do you think of Erner? I said, well, he's 180 pounds. I'm 180 pounds. He's six foot tall. I'm six foot tall. Good stuff. He's got a 34 waist. I got a 34 waist. Wow. We're the same weight. We're the same height. We're the same everything. Like a boxing match. He's got a a different, (laughs) he's got a different, he's got a really uh, excited uh, fan base. And I didn't have that. I had, I always had an exciting fan base of mine too. He had more fans than I had. I know that. And he's really super popular. I grew up in the South. I grew up in the Midwest. But, uh, you know, I, it, one of them was, we had two people standing side by side. We're both human beings, you know? Yeah. And we were both exactly the same size and the same weight and everything. Both going at it. Yeah, just going at it. So it was, it was, it was cool, though. I, I miss him a lot. I miss him a ton because he'd be real influential and he'd be rolling his eyes in a good way and a bad way about things that are going on in his sport. He'd have an opinion. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to call an audible right there. Uh, and we do that on the Kenny conversation. You're going to make me ask another question. Uh, me and you talked before, uh, and we all do this, and you've taught me pretty much everything I know. Uh, I'll add Dick Trickle in there, and, of course, Dad and our family. But I, but I think between my big brother, Rusty, Dad, brother Mike, uh, you know, you you said to me, maybe I quit – Maybe I quit NASCAR. Maybe I retired two years too early. Do you feel like when Earnhardt passed away that, you know, that was a bummer and that maybe you said to hell with it? What was your thought there? Uh, yeah, I mean, it was, him passing away was really a tough deal because I'll never forget, uh, you know, there was people already questioning, hey, is when are you going to hang it up, you know? Uh, you've already accomplished a ton. Do you want to keep on going? And let's face it, my my consistency, the amount of races I was winning per year and how I was running was good still, but it wasn't as good as in the past. So it made people question, hey, how much, when are you going to hang this up? Well, you won 10 races in one year in 93, I believe. 10 or 93 was my strongest year. Then the following year in 84, we won eight races. And so Jesus. those yeah. mid nineties were incredible. And that's, the era that I raced with Earnhardt yeah. all through the nights. And uh, that's the reason I was always so confident around him because uh, yeah, I beat him a ton and he beat me a ton, you know, and oh, yeah. I, never, I never could be as good as speedway racers. He was, yeah. he was an incredible Daytona and Talladega racer. Yeah. I could run with him anywhere else. Uh, Talladega and Daytona, he just was magic, you know? And yeah. so I wish I could have been that good at those places. That's, that's one thing in my – when I'm all said and done, I wish I could have won the Daytona 500. Yeah. But I got close many times. You know? well, I, I think, Rusty, I think anybody's like that in life with anything. Uh, I've read a lot of stories about it, a lot of great athletes. There's always more. But but you, do, do you feel like that was one of the reasons uh, – I mean, I, I thought you did the right thing, and I told you that. Well, it, it, was definitely, it was definitely one of the reasons I retired after seeing him pass away. And you know, then you have people talk to you about how much longer you want to go. And, and the guy that set me down and did that to me was Bill France Jr. Hmm. He was in my office. I was, he asked me to come to his office one time, and it was about five days before Speed Weeks, and I was down there. And I'm big into aviation. He was big into aviation, Mr. France was. So it was all, we were talking about airplanes and different things like that. And he said, man, so I want to talk about your career. I said, oh, yeah, go ahead. He said, I'm hearing people talking about that you've been asked a lot of questions about when you're going to hang it up. He said, I just want to tell you one thing. He said, you got your health right now. You're healthy, looking good. And he said, I, I noticed you're paying a lot of attention to business stuff. 
And he said, you're not running as good as you used to, but you're still running good. And he said, I remember his hand, he held it up. He said, I remember when your career was like this, man. You were just going up, 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 up. He said, well, now you kind of like this. You kind of up on that top of that deal and you're just teetering back and forth, you know? Yeah. And he said, so, you know, I'm not, I'm not telling you to quit, but I'm telling you this sport can use you in a lot more ways than you just driving that car every single week and going through that with all the rest of them drivers. I said, okay, I keep that in mind. That week, we go to Daytona. Earnhardt gets killed. Mm. I go to the care center, me and Patty, right after we heard about his accident. I, I, I haul over in the car over to the hospital and I walk inside. There's Mr. France. There's everybody standing there. Mm. And they came out and they announced that he passed away. Mm. And I just looked over at Mr. France. He was standing right there. I looked over at him. You know what he did? He looked me right now and he held his hand up like this and he went. Oh, unbelievable story. He Very said, daunting. He said, this was, he yeah. just wanted to remind me. I told you, you don't have to keep doing this. Yeah. And he looked straight at me and went like that. And, I went, no, wow. he and it was, I'll never forget that long as I live. And, uh, and so then I, I thought about it, you know, and then at, at the same time, I get an offer from the networks. I had an offer from uh, two networks to go to work for him. I said, well, you know what? If I don't make this announcement now, it's never going to happen. Yeah. You know, if somebody else would get it. And you, won, you won in your last year of racing. You went into the playoffs, and, and you ended your career in NASCAR winning. Uh, let's well, remember. actually, I won in 2004 in Martinsville, Virginia. Yeah. Announced my retirement after that. Yeah. And ran the next year in 2005 and made it into the playoffs. Right. But I didn't win. Okay. But I made it into the playoffs, which is a real – I said I always wanted to go out on top of my game. And I thought, you know, yeah. I had a lot of second-place finishes that year, that my final year. I led a bunch of laps, and I made it to the chase for the championship. So my heart, I went out on top like that. There's a lot of drivers that go out with having some really crappy runs for years and finally say it's – you know, and I didn't want to be that guy. Yeah. Well, brother, we, we can keep going. I just want to let you know we're, we're getting close to the end here. This is one of these deals where I can go forever. I, we, had to, we had to skip some things, and you, you mentioned so many good things that made me want to ask you about Earnhardt. I did, I did, hey, listen, I did my due diligence, okay? I, I, got, I got my notes. Hey, man, you're organized. You're looking good. Well, I, I, I don't want to mess up, you know. Uh, hey, I, I, what are you, what are you going to do? What are you going to do now when people come up to you and say, "Hey, man, what's your brother doing nowadays?" What are you going <laughs> to tell them? I'm going to go look at the Kenny conversation. He, he, we tell you everything. Well, I'll tell you what. You know, one thing we didn't talk about is Southern Country Customs. We didn't yeah, and talk that's that's about the motorcycle stuff. But yeah, obviously, the car business is just incredible. It's doing real well, and I've been able to surround myself with some cool people. But Probably one of the most fun things I think I've ever got myself into. Motorcycles. What the hell is that all about? You ride with me. Everybody yep. rides with us. We go to Sturgis. We go to Daytona. We go to places all over the country riding motorcycles now. Steven started building these things. Him and I started this company. We're 50-50 owners on it right now. Southern Country Custom. But we're building some just amazing, badass bikes. And I think he's probably one of the top five builders in the USA right he now is. For, that, for that type of motorcycle. Yeah. And uh, it's incredible, dude. We're having a great time. And uh, I've been coming down to Daytona a lot because we ride a lot of motorcycles down here. And we we spent a lot of time at a place called the Broken Spoke where we set up camp for our Southern Country Customs and do business there during all the rallies. And we're going to be there again. There you go. Southern Country Customs. That's it. Follow us on Instagram and YouTube and all that and on the, the website. But we'll be back down here in October for Bike October Fest. It's going to be another big one. Uh, we'll be set up again at that broken spoke. But look, the people I've been able to meet uh, outside of NASCAR through uh, the motorcycle stuff has been incredible. I've seen contractors. Uh, we talk about the uh, the neat, neat things we do with the charitable stuff. Uh, we just sold a motorcycle for charity for $95,000 from uh, one of our friends who lives in St. Louis. And uh, that was a great deal that was. And uh, I've been doing the, and the a, and a man for five years. A man that yeah, and then another man added five grand, so you got one hundred thousand dollars for that bike. Yeah. Uh, hey, so Southern Country Customs. Yeah. Uh, I know what it is, and everybody says, "Man, those bikes are unbelievable." But I do want to remind everybody, 
you start with a stock Harley Davidson, and then how do you design these bikes? Well, what we do, we start brand new motorcycles, 2023 20, models, or we started in 21, so we start with new 21s, and then now here's 2023, 20, so we're doing 2023s. 20, and what we'll do, we'll talk to the customer about the, the, the paint schemes that they like and all that, and we'll we'll design it ourselves. And then we got our own body kits. And now that we're putting carbon fiber wheels on them, and these bikes are anywhere from 80 to 130,000 for the real nice ones. Real, not nice ones, they're all nice. But for the, the ones got the real big engines and all you, carbon fiber wheels. And now stuff they like can that. choose what they want. I, I get it. You, you can start here and you can go more and more and more. <laughs> big there's, 139 there's cubic now. inch. Now we're building these, these things with 139 cubic inch motors. And that's like having a 2000 horsepower uh, engine in your street car. Okay. Yeah. You, you balance that when it comes to weight ratio and stuff like that. Build a big engine, big wheels. Now we're doing carbon fiber wheels. It's amazing paint. Uh, when people say, I don't get it, I said, go to, uh, to number one, go to Southern Country Customs and look at all the pictures. Instagram's awesome. Yeah, go to Instagram or go to our, our gallery on uh, southerncountrycustoms.com. Look at all that. And you'll see them. And everybody goes, oh, my God, I cannot believe what I'm seeing. They yeah. all say the same thing. And so we're having a blast doing that. Really get to travel the country and see different people and the different people that maybe might not be at a NASCAR race all the time, but they're still uh, enthusiasts when it comes to motorcycles and having fun. Yeah, and I want to add that uh, Stephen, uh, Stephen Wallace, your boy, my nephew, the love of my life, that kid is incredibly talented and he can do it all. I, I watch him powder coat. I watch him put these things together. I just wanted to add that in there. And I know you and him got it going on. And uh, of course, Josh there. I saw you are looking for another person. You're, you're growing. We're growing. Need more, need more personnel. We need more people that are qualified that can, uh, Build these bikes. We need good tech, so we need people that want to have fun and, and smile all the time. Uh, you know, I want I want them to focus, but I want them to have fun and be a good uh, a good partner with this. I don't, I'm not looking for partners. I'm looking for good builders that can help us grow this business. So let's end like this, brother. I'm going to rattle some names off, right. and uh, we're at 55 minutes, and one hour is about limit. Uh, I'm going to name some names. And then when I'm done naming them, you know, we could go on another hour, but let's just say this. Okay. You have had some people in your life that I know for a fact mean everything to you. Uh, Roger Penske, the great Dick Trickle, Don the Snake Perdome, Walker Evans, Don Miller, and, and Dick Pacer. Uh, of course, you know, there's Patty, your wife, but those six, they're pretty nucleus. What, what's your thought when you hear those names? Well, those are all super smart people, mm. really incredibly smart people. And those are all the people that were around me. Uh, maybe not Walker of the very late or the early part of my career, but the late part of my career he was. He inspired those all, you. Those were people that really taught me a ton and stayed with me and helped me build my career and built me as that. Now of late, uh, my guy, Rob Williams, who works at our office, he's just an incredible person, just really looks after our company and does a great job at, you know, doing what he, what he does. And he does a lot. But those ones you just mentioned, those were the ones that were there from the beginning. Yeah. Uh, when we lived in St. Louis, Missouri, that followed me down to, you know, NASCAR land to chase, chase the dream. Yeah. And they all end up working with me. Um, right. Don Miller, Dick Pacer. Yeah, all of them. Big names, good guys. Yeah. Well, brother, listen, uh, I appreciate it so much. You know, I, hey, listen, I, I really thought about, you know, having you as my first guest, but I thought, well, you know, he'll say yes because uh, you're incredible to me. So, we're going to end the show a little bit like this. I wrote this disclaimer here and I said, here's my disclaimer. Rusty Wallace is my big brother and uh, Rusty and Mike spoil me. And I have the best brothers that anybody could ever have. Um, you've made it to where I've had a wonderful life. Of course you made me work for it, 
But uh, I just want to thank you uh, so much for everything you've done for me. Definitely wouldn't be where I'm at without you. And, and thank you for being on the show. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. I hope the show turns out good. And I hope that people enjoy listening to what we had to say and how we bantered back and forth and all that stuff. We'll see what yeah. happens. Well, now everybody knows what Rusty Wallace has been up to. Now, remember, we are in podcast form. You can listen to us on the way to work, and then you can listen to us on the way home. Spotify, iTunes. And until then, remember, the Kenny conversation just keeps on going, and we're going to have the ladies. I, Danica Patrick's coming up soon. Jimmy Johnson. Until then, we'll see you next time.